I'm John Doe. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity. I uh, do see this as opportunity, uh, an opportunity for me and for, for us at ASML to share some of our ideas uh, because we are contemplating some fairly substantial and ambitious ideas. Um, and I think this is a, this is a very good um, community and an audience to, to test out those ideas. So I'll welcome any questions and any feedback. Um, please add it to the chat and then if I don't get around to it in the allocated time, then maybe we can talk about it afterwards. But this is the, the topic is, is this role of the system model. And what I mean with system model is, is the output or, or the, the, uh, the result of the work done in Capella, in, in this case, or, or a modeling tool. But yes, we are using Capella, or more accurately, we are using system modeling workbench. And, and that plays a very important role for us. But I will get to that in a moment. Uh, we've also adopted a little icon here that's shown here on the screen as kind of the, the icon for this, this work that we are doing in this company. And it is supposed to represent this system model that we are creating. And we like to show people that it has kind of two flavors or two views to it. And so a functional view and a production system view, which is a kind of an odd name, but it is the name that we use. Um, it corresponds directly to the Arcadia concepts of behavior components and node or host components. So that's what you should keep in mind here. But again, I will not tarry too long on this first slide and rather get into the content, if I can get that right. So as a quick overview of what I'll be talking about, um, so I'll very briefly introduce what this is about and why this is even a question that we should be asking or that we are asking in this case. And then I'll, I'll briefly, uh, it, it seems like a lot, so it seems like many slides, but that, it's really not the, the case. They are mostly short, uh, quick views. Um, but I need to tell you a little bit about ASML because it would be a shame not to, because it is a very interesting company, but also to, to make it clear why we we need to answer, we as in the company needs to answer this question. And my hope is that by explaining this question that we are contemplating, it might also be helpful to, to other people um, who have a similar challenge ahead of them. Uh, so this number four is really where I'll get into the, the content of what I want to talk about. And as you can see, it's not that much. And then I'll just uh, at the end draw some conclusions and, and bring it all together. So quite simply, we know that model-based systems engineering is the way to go. There is no question for us about that. We are already working on it. Uh, we, are, we have adopted Capella, or System Modeling Workbench. I'll be using those two pretty much interchangeably. I am aware that there's a difference between them, but for the purposes of this talk, uh, the, 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 the difference isn't really that important, except for the part where I'll explain what that difference is. So we will, we are going the model-based systems engineering way, but we want to, we are asking ourselves to what extent do we want to do this? To what extent does it make sense to, to go um, down the rabbit hole of model-based systems engineering, creating a model that represents a product? And, and that's really what I'm showing today is, is that this rabbit hole can go pretty far, but every, step you go further, you do expect some value or some benefit from it, but you also incur cost. And I will certainly not be doing anything like a real cost benefit analysis or anything like that. But I want to provide some guidance on the types of benefits or costs you can expect. So I, I then put that, I try to at least put that together into a central question. What role does the system model play in the digital thread? And talking about that, um, so the, um, the, the objective for, for this presentation is to provide some guidance. So that's what I try to write there. Um, so as I said, you have to balance the, the benefit and the cost, um, but it would be helpful if you had some guidance in order to kind of look for those to, to maybe articulate the type of benefits and costs you, you can expect here. 
I structured this in <laughs> what I just call some a ladder of ambition or levels of ambition, taking some a, a cue from a, one of my previous supervisors. I didn't really want to call it a framework or, or anything a, li a bit more uh, academically uh, related because it's really not at that point yet. This is really just a, a structuring of some experience and knowledge we've gained over the last few years um, in, in implementing and adopting model-based systems engineering in a configuration management type approach. And I'll explain that in a moment. So this, these are the six levels of ambition, if, as I call them. Um, and I will be going through each of them. And as you can see on the very small thumbnails, I do have some fairly detailed diagrams that I have to show you and, and to explain what this is all about. But we'll get to that at the end. So if you're wondering, and then I expect many of you might be, so why is this a question in the first place? Um, because model-based systems engineering is certainly not that new, right? And systems engineering is really not new. And configuration management is also not new. So, so why now suddenly this question? And why, why are we trying to answer it? And I've, I've tried to explain this in, in the normal old business pool and um, technology push type view. So we very simply stated, and there's a lot of detail on this slide, but our systems are really increasing complexity. That's certainly not unique to ASML, but it is quite, quite substantial. And, and we need a way to manage this complexity and, and obviously also the complexity of the product as it moves through its life cycle. And on the other side, on the push side, fortunately for us, there is now this wonderful opportunity for us to connect, to expose our system model or the system architecture model to, or to connect it to Team Center, to our PLM or product lifecycle management tool. And, and we use Team Center in ASML. And this is a very good opportunity, but also very important to us that we will we are able to make this Capella model available in Team Center. And I, I try to put it as a little illustration there. So if you add Capella and Team Center together, kind of you get system modeling workbench. It's, it's not really a correct way of showing it. System modeling workbench, as I understand it at least, is the capability of Capella to connect Team Center. And that's crucial for us because all the rest of our product data is in Team Center. And it really makes sense for us to, to now add the system model there. Um, we also are using Team for Capella to create, uh, collaboratively create this, this system model, this quite sizable model that we are creating. And then the idea is to publish this model to Team Center, making it available for downstream use. And it's really about that downstream use, right? So what else do we want to do with the model? I mean, it obviously, in its own right, has immense value. It, it is a tool for analysis and understanding, but it also has potential additional use. And, and that's really what we are thinking about now. What else do we want to get out of this? And as I said earlier, if you want to derive additional value, you also incur cost. And we have to be mindful of that. So uh, to just uh, give some context, what I mean with all these things, um, I have a very simple view of configuration management. And the next slide is about the digital thread. Um, I don't know if I'm correct, but this is usually what comes to mind when I think about these topics. So it is, for me, when we talk about um, configuration management, it is about keeping these three things in equilibrium or aligned or aligned with each other or consistent with each other. So you want to know that the real product as it exists in reality is accurately reflected by your configuration information, your documentation or your product data. And that both of those also um, correspond to what is expected of the product by the customer or by whoever has requirements for that product. So when I talk about configuration management, I talk about the activities to keep these things in mind, uh, in line with each other, in, mind, in line with each other and consistent and in equi equilibrium and so on. So I, I copied a very inappropriate um, definition of configuration management there from a, from a nuclear energy standard. But it is the one I prefer, and it's the one that most accurately reflects my 
understanding of it. Now that's just to get to the next point where my very simple understanding of the digital thread is I, I really have in mind a literal thread as it as it well not literal and you know obviously not but a thread as it moves from one piece of data or from the real product in the in the field to from one piece of data to the other one to eventually getting back to the source requirement for why something exists in the first place. So I apologize for my very bad slide and, and please note that these uh, types of um, images, so any CAD drawings are not ASML ones. I copy that from some Google image, so it's not relevant. I'm not allowed to show any CAD data in, in presentations like this. So even the, the diagrams, the Capella diagrams that I'll be showing are completely anonymized and fictitious. And it's, it's not, it doesn't represent the real product. And unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show it, but it does a, a adequate job of uh, illustrating the point. So as I said, from the original or from the real thing in reality to some detailed design information, to some architectural information and all the way back to the uh, originating requirement. That's what I mean with the digital thread. I hope it's an acceptable definition of it. And it is in any way the one I'll be using for the rest of this presentation. So uh, it would be a shame if I don't tell you a little bit about the company. So uh, I don't think it's a very well-known brand worldwide, although we are quite um, impactful on, on, the, on the world stage. So we are a manufacturer or developer and manufacturer of, of lithography machines, lithography scanning machines. So these are the machines that uh, create or at least it plays a part in creating the, the transistors in a silicon chip. And this slide is, is not my slide. The, the next few slides I just took from the, the company presentation slides. So that's why they will be much better than my own slides. But uh, this one shows that this has been an ongoing endeavor for the world for the last 120 years um, to essentially make these logic processes smaller and smaller. and um, Often the, the, the Moore's law is applied and, and people think that only or, or usually people um, associate the density of transistors to, to that law. But it, it's really an economic law uh, showing that the calculations that we can perform per, uh, per, per second or per uh, money uh, currency unit, that's really the, the the linear increase over time that we are talking about, sorry, not linear, geometric increase over time that we that we have here. So the, the size of the transistors are getting smaller, but also the, the number of calculations is really the, the improvement that we have here. So uh, as a bit of a view, so the first circuit on a silicon and um, the size of a fingernail is a, is a nice picture from 1959. And today we can obviously fit in billions of transistors on the same area, on the same size, in the same size in the silicon chip. So it's been a remarkable improvement. And, and clearly ASML has not been alone in this. And, and th that's also not the claim here. But we do play a very important role here. And I think oh, well, there's another one to just explain um, how this has improved. So. Uh, resulting in, in the, the things we make use of in our daily lives, right? So if you compare 1984, so it's one year before I was born, and uh, we're not referring to the novel year, so just the year 1984, uh, to today, you can see that there's been quite a substantial improvement. And I don't think, think this is news to anyone, but it is always quite interesting to put these two together or to put them side by side to just really see the type of improvement we're talking about here. Okay, so here is a very conceptual um, explanation of the semiconductor manufacturing process or loop. Uh, it's, it's called a loop because a um, silicon um, wafer goes through this loop multiple times. Uh, it's, it's not an a, a end to end process, it, it does get, get repeated multiple times. And right, let me just do something here. Just give me a second, please. Um, 
We at ASML, uh, our, we are best known, and, and this is our main business line as well. We manufacture, or develop, and manufacture the systems that does the exposure part. So this is where we use the lithography to expose the silicon wafer to ultraviolet light, and the ultraviolet light, by uh, interacting with the chemicals on the wafer, it creates those gates, those transistors. And lithography is the only production step to process the, the wafer die by die, so not to process the entire wafer. So the, the wafer is um, 300 millimeters in, in diameter. Uh, this is the, this process, the exposure step, does every die, every small die on that wafer individually, and it's the only part of that. Uh, only only step in the process that does it on that level, and that's why the lithography scanners are such an important part of this process. As you can see, it's not the only part, and it's also also not the only um, product that ASML produces, but it is arguably the most important part of the semiconductor manufacturing process. So uh, I think it would be good to give you some impression of how this machine works. We have a small video here. I hope it displays properly, um, but this is a very old machine. So it's 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 also deliberate and deliberately an old machine because it makes things simpler and it makes it easier to understand and to show because the, the new machines are substantially larger. So we have a we have an entrance. So there's there's a uh, sorry not the entrance. There's a, a laser that is generated. Um, Sorry, there's a light that is generated, and we, we then use the illumination system and to illuminate the reticle that, that sits up, up here. And the reticle is really the container of the pattern that goes that, that is exposed on the on the silicon wafer. We then demagnify that reticle pattern as it is obviously um, or captured by the light. We demagnify it until we get to a very small size. And then we move around the silicon wafer underneath this optical column to expose the silicon or the, the photoresist dye, the photoresist on the silicon to this ultraviolet light. So that's a very basic look of how these machines work. And, and they seem very simple now, but they have become astonishingly complicated um, as of late. And I will in the in the next few slides I will show why it's become such a complicated thing. So there you can see what's what one die on a silicon wafer. And there's um, I have to show this. These are such nice slides in it, and I, I always people always respond quite well to these. So if you zoom in, you can see that it's also a three-dimensional structure, of course. It's not just a a very complicated um, circuit ball of circuit pattern. It's also it has connections between the different layers on it. And, and that also helps to explain why the wafers go through the manufacturing loop multiple times to create all these layers. And if you can think about it, then obviously when we put one, when we have one layer and we want to put another layer on top of that, and there are connections between these layers, then the they have to be aligned properly. Otherwise, the connections will be lost or not quite as good quality as it needs to be. And any minor quality defect in here will be a loss of power for that for that semiconductor chip. So a little look at some of the technology, and um, I only include this because this helps to explain why we are contemplating this question. So I'm going to very quickly go through these because um, I don't have a lot of time, but it is still interesting. So sorry. Our machines have grown immensely in size. So as the, the, the transistors get smaller, the machines get larger. And here we, we are now showing our uh, high uh, nominal aperture machines that we are working on at the moment. And they are humongous. I have a bit slide a little bit later to, to show how, how big they have become now. But it's, it's nice to see the humble beginnings here in the 1980s uh, up to where we are now. So um, I can actually skip that. I'm not going to repeat that again. I already covered it slightly. So our probably I think our first well-known innovation was to to go from a single stage where the wafer um, is. I think sorry. Is this a, uh, so now we have two places for a wafer to to be held during um, during the production. So the the wafer is here on the one side. It is one of the wafers is measured. 
and load it and unload it and so on, while the other, other wafer is undergoing exposure underneath the optical column. And obviously, this has major uh, implications or improvements for product productivity, so throughput of wafers. And this is quite a long time ago, but this was a very important innovation for, for ASML, but also for the industry at, uh, at large. We've also moved uh, wavelength quite substantially from, from uh, half a, well, almost 500 nanometers. I can't remember what the largest size of a meter is. Uh, until the, the or down to the, the smallest week, uh, well, this is already a few years old, but in 2011, we achieved 13 and a half nanometers with our new EUV uh, platform. So that's the current uh, cutting edge, I would say. We also, at some point, introduced water, surprisingly, <laughs> into the optical column. So instead of having air between the lens and the wafer, you can have water, which is a more predictable substance for the photons, photons to move through. I'm sorry, I'm going through this a little bit quickly, but I want to get to the content. And uh, lately, now that we are in extreme ultraviolet, so I should just explain, this is deep ultraviolet light and extreme ultraviolet. So extreme is shorter wavelength than deep, if you're wondering. But in order to achieve a consistent image with ultraviolet or extreme ultraviolet light, we had to make the uh, exposure chamber, or we had to achieve a near vacuum because the, the air molecules get in the way, obviously. We also have a new light source, which is much stronger. I'll show that in a moment. And uh, some new mirror optics I'll also cover just in a moment. So uh, to, to show you what this really means, um, I had to take a double, double take to, to understand the slide completely. But the idea is that you can do all of that. Um, so what's explained here about all those, um, so 2,625 times the, the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy on the edge of an A4 paper, which I think is quite remarkable. And I, I, I know people also enjoy it when, when they see this. And then um, finally, to, to give you an idea of the size of this machine. So as you can see, it weighs uh, more than 180 tons. And it we, we uh, transport this in 40 containers, 20 trucks, and three fully loaded 747s. So it's quite an endeavor to get this from our factory to the place where it will be operated, mostly in um, at the you know at, at any of the big fabs like Samsung or Intel or so on, and um, it also generates quite a lot of data. And this this little sentence here um, explains a little why we are really thinking about what we want to get from this system model, because we have more than a thousand five hundred sensors and. All those sensors are functionally relevant, right? But we clearly can't make a model with 1,500 objects only for the sensors because there's also a whole bunch of other things in there. That seems to be crossing some line of, of the, 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 that would make the model probably unmaintainable in some way. But okay, so all of these slides were really, um, oh wait, I think there's one more. So our latest innovation has been the source. It is a remarkable piece of equipment. I still struggle to believe it, but the, in order to generate the extreme ultraviolet light, we eject a constant stream of 10 um, droplets. They are a few micrometers in size. And then we hit a 10 droplet with a first low intensity pulse to flatten it, and then with a high intensity pulse to evaporate it, which then produces a plasma which emits extreme ultraviolet light with a 13.5 nanometer wavelength. And this happens 50,000 times per second. Um, so they tell me. I still struggle to believe it, but it works. So there you go. And uh, I can skip that. It's not that important for now. So uh, sorry, um, all of these, uh, I, I explained all of this to to really convince you that this is a highly complex product and it needs, um, we have to manage it in configurations. It is not, when we, when we produce a very new product, then uh, we often have to scale or stage when we introduce new um, equipment or new components to that product. They're not always already at the same time. And our customers also need some time to get to know the new products. 
So we've made a decision to manage our products in different configurations. Certainly not unique to ASML, but it is a new undertaking for us. And that prompted us to think about the role of the system model. So as I explained earlier, if we want to um, connect our architecture de uh, definition, our architecture information to the rest of the product information and the requirements, we have to understand how we connect it. So here is the, the, the ladder of ambition, as I called it, or the levels of ambition. And in my view, every time you go up this, this, this ladder, you, you can derive some benefit from it, but you also have some cost. Now, I very quickly want to show you, I do realize that I'm running out of time, but I want to show you what all of this means. So you might think now, why am I putting the same uh, diagram three times on, the on one slide? But they are actually different. So on the left-hand side, you see there's a logical architecture diagram. So this is a Capella diagram. And I have two different, although very similar, physical architecture diagrams. And this really, the, the idea here is to show how the product evolves, architecturally show how the product evolves. Because the important bit here is that we manage our components in variants. So there we have a laser, and we also have a laser. They both get, come from the original light source there as a, as a conceptual or a, a logical component, but they are two different variants, and they would have different requirements, different parameters, and potentially perform their functions to a different extent, right? The one can generate maybe a uh, stronger light than the other one. So this is what I call product road mapping. And uh, when you only want to do this, you practically have no constraints. There's not much cost you incur. You can do this freely as long as you stick to the, the syntax that you have selected. And in this case, it would be Arcadia. If you want to be a bit braver, so a bit more ambitious, then you can start thinking about using your system model as input, as a structure to, to or as input to structure your work breakdown structure, to, to decide on the work that must be performed. So here again, I have this realization, two realizations of one logical architecture. And I have shown that some of them will be reused, right? So you would not necessarily have to assign a project or some work to that. Uh, you can also think about, you can also take this one step further and then also assign responsibility or some accountability or ownership of those items that must be developed. You can do that in the model, of course. I just use property values here. Don't have to do it that way. But when you do this, then you have to think about, I have to maintain this organizational information in my model or it related to my model. So there is additional work to be done. And that work or that information must be maintained forever at least, or at least as, as long as you want to manage the product. Another level up, so now we're at level three. Now you can start looking at the system model as input to detail design. I think this is very well known. Most people understand this. Again, this is not a ASML picture on this right hand side. This I took from some um, uh, article about reliability engineering. This is an illustration of a FMIA or FMICA that can be performed. And obviously, you can use the functions and the components and the interfaces defined, captured, represented in your model as input into such an analysis. Similarly, this is a picture of um, Siemens Capital, so the electrical and electronic design tool. And, and this I, I selected this one because there are, is actually an interface between these two, between Capella and Capital. So you can use your multidisciplinary definition of your product as input into the detailed design of the electronics and the electric electrical um, architecture. Number four in this ladder. So if you, and, then, and this is really where we are, um, what we are doing or what we are, we have started doing in ASML now, where we use the model as an expression of product configurations or an expression of compatibility. So what, so again, two very similar diagrams with small differences. Here I have laser variant A and here I have laser variant B. They are very similar in nature, but they do differ in some important ways. And here, me, uh, so I, I see there's a little bit of allocation problem there, but th that shouldn't matter. I, as the architect, so get have the opportunity to here explain that this laser 
this variant B, or let me rather say this sensor, op this optical unit is compatible with variant B of the laser and variant A of the laser because I reuse that port. So I, I'm not sure if that's clear to the audience, but I have a single sensor, a variant B in this case, connected to two different lasers. And that gives some information about what is allowed to be installed in the machine, what is allowed to work with something else. If you see this... John Rowe, uh, sorry for the interruption. I will have to cut you very soon. I'm sorry because it's so interesting. So I'll give you one or two more minutes to wrap up and then we'll have to... So to I am very close to finished. So you can then use that explicit knowledge captured in your model to derive your configuration definitions or the rules that you want to apply. This is a screenshot from Teams in the product configurator. And that's how you capture some rules. So here I said the alignment sensor 1000, just as a name, is incompatible with the full color light source. And that you can derive from the explicit knowledge captured in your model. Uh, you can also view this on Team Center side. So that's what really makes us, ex us excited because all of this knowledge that you capture in the model can now be also put into Team Center. This is a screenshot from Team Center. You can see that same port there on the optical units. So this one is compatible with both, but that optical unit is not compatible with both. And then the second last one, um, this will be very quick because I think this is well, also quite well known and quite well understood. You can use your model as the link between your requirements and the rest of your information, right? You can um, complement your model, your diagram with requirements as I show here. These are also team center requirements and they can be associated to system elements or to functions or to interfaces. And then you get to a very nice picture. I try to mimic a bit of a V, a V model here. So you see your decomposition here associated to requirements and then your aggregation or your synthesis again on the right hand side. And this is then represented by your architecture model, but also similarly by your bill of material, right? So these are bill of material items on the right hand side, and these are your architecture nodes. And this is kind of tied back into this whole idea of uh, equilibrium between the product and the requirements and your uh, documentation. Last slide then is where you now can start crossing out some of your requirements, right? If you really adopt a proper model-based approach, then many of your requirements will no longer be necessary. And there will be many other talks about that again um, oh, as well in this, in this Capella day, so I don't have to cover this so much. But I think it is also generally recognized that the model is able to express or contain requirements. But there's also a cost with that. How do you verify against those requirements that are implicit in your model? And that's it. So I don't have to talk through all of that, but that's just a bit of a summary of everything I just said. So you always have a potential benefit, but you also likely incur some costs as you move up this ladder. So when you get to that point. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John Rowe, for a great talk. So uh, uh, without further ado, we'll move to the questions because there are a number of them. So the most upvoted question uh, is, how did you manage those two different physical architecture realizations? Have you made two models? Are they coexisting? That seems to be intriguing a lot of people. Oh, so, uh, I have to be careful what I answer here, but it is a very good question. It's something we've been working on for a while. So there's a bunch of ways to get around that, right, or, or to, to um, represent such different physical architectures. You can, of course, just have multiple objects that, that carry the same name, or more uh, excitingly, you would probably want to use something like the rec replica construct that is available in Capella. It's a very nice way to keep your uh, different copies or duplicates or replicas of objects in line with each other. Uh, that's probably the easiest way and the best way to do it. Uh, there may be other ways as well, um, but it would probably need some additional explanation. Um, you can uh, you can simply have an arrangement where you where you apply. If you have the same name, you then always consider that to be the same object. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not really giving a clear answer here, but I don't want to uh, reveal anything that I'm not supposed to reveal. So I will maybe allow Laurent to to say something if you want to about that. 
Uh, I think we are too short on time, unfortunately, but uh, okay. let's, let's just say that we have made some specific uh, development for the, the need of ASML in this regard. Okay, okay. And then we, 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 we should leave it there, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is that you mentioned that there are 1,500 sensors and that is way too much to model. And uh, the questioner would argue that it is even harder to manage it in document-based. So how do you manage this concurrently? Why can't you extend that to, to the models? Oh, well, um, yeah, maybe I should, I should say that it's, it's obviously not impossible. It's certainly not theoretically impossible. It, it, it's a matter of whether it's practically possible or practically desirable is even more important. So many of those sensors are uh, obviously probably oh, catalog items, so we don't necessarily want to architecturally describe them. But we also have many other tools, right, where you really look at your, your control loops or your sensor input into some data processing. Uh, I think we use Capital and many other tools to do that. And we don't necessarily want to represent some of them in the system model as well. I think the more interesting question is which ones should we represent in the system model? And that is a question that's been bugging us for a while. So you, you have to come up with some sort of criteria for when something should be or should not be included in the system model. Um, for us, to answer the question, why can't we include all 1,500? I fully agree that it's more difficult to do it in documents, but we're also not convinced we want to do it in the model. Uh, it would just be too much of a maintenance burden for us to do that, to manage all those sensors as variants in context with everything else. Uh, we do rely quite a lot on um, the stability of our architecture of our machines. So they don't, they, they obviously grow in size and there are various changes as they go, through, as we evolve the product. But many of those smaller sensors, if I can call them that, do stay very similar. And that would minimize or decrease the value of putting them in the model. It's just not that architecturally important for us to include okay. it. Thank you, John. I'm sorry to interrupt. I would like to give you just one minute for a last question and then we'll have to move on and you'll have to answer the other questions offline. So the last question uh, that's uh, interesting for uh, for people is how do you manage requirements? Do you integrate them to Capella? Not yet. Um, that is, is actively uh, a, a, a ongoing workshop and, and discussion we have. So not yet because we I'm very interested in the last talk of today because we also have thousands and thousands of requirements and we have to figure out what to do that uh, to do about that. So that's clearly something we're thinking about. But uh, at the moment, our requirements are in documents. Uh, sorry, our requirements are in a requirements management tool. And we are now wondering whether we want to start connecting those requirements. For now, we will only connect documents because that is more easily achievable for us in the short term.